welcome to another episode of the Fitness Oracle. Today, we sit down with Yogi Aaron from the Yogi Club. Yogi Aaron is one of the most sought after teachers today. Yogi Aaron is trailblazing a new path in the world of yoga. He is known for his unorthodox perspectives on stretching and flexibility and how both can cause more harm than good. His teachings aim to help as many people as possible live a pain-free life so they can realize yoga's true intention. This is one of the episodes that I was looking that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. When I came across Yogi Aaron, I was blown away to, to realize and to come to the understanding to see that there was somebody who was implementing my thought process on exercise terminology and apply it to an industry that is so, I'm not going to say wrong, I'm not going to say misled, shifted to mainstream. And for an industry, for this industry that is so unmainstream, how they use mainstream terms to, to identify specific certain topics. Um, in this episode, we talk about Ayama. We talk about MAT, which is muscle activation technique. We talk about connection. We talk about stretching, something that him and I both agree on. And we talk about the how he implements it during his yoga sessions, which is quite interesting because the way that we were taught how to do MAT, I don't know MAT, but I did, I've done Jumpstart. Um, it's on a table and he doesn't have a table while he's doing classes. It's quite interesting. You need to listen to this show. It is, it is, it is on fire, this show. Uh, really, uh, grab, a, grab a pen and paper, grab a cup of joe, and really pay attention to what we're talking about here because you are going to love this show. Welcome to the Fitness Oracle, where we have real conversations. I'm going to have to redo them. Third time I'm doing this today. <laughs> Welcome to the Fitness Oracle, where we have real conversations with real people, just like you, with real stories, just like yours. And this is one of their stories. I am your host, John Katsavos. My guest today is Yogi Aaron from the Yogi Club. One of he is one of the most sought after teachers today. Yogi Aaron is trailblazing a new path in the world of yoga, known who is known for his unorthodox perspectives on stretching, flex and flexibility, and how both cause more harm than good. His teachings aim to help as many people as possible live a pain free life, so they can realize yoga's true intentions he is the creator of a revolutionary approach to yoga applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation ayama and the online platform the yogi club host of the yoga podcast stop stretching author of autobiography of a naked yogi and the fourth and the forthcoming book, Stop Stretching, a new yogic, yogic approach to master your body and live pain-free, and is the co-owner of Blue Osa Yoga Retreat and Spa in Costa Rica, where he leads the Yogi Club, yoga teacher training immersions year-round for students from all across the globe. Yogi Aaron, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. <laughs> I am really excited to have you on the show. Uh, finally, somebody who can speak my language. <laughs> um, but before we get into it, how's beautiful Costa Rica? Well, you can see behind me, it's just really, I mean, today, it we've just got this beautiful clear skies. 
and um, lately it's been raining a lot, um, unseasonably amount of rain, and which is not normal. And so we've just had these beautiful blue skies. And after all this rain, everything is just so green and lush and beautiful. All of the tropical birds are like singing away. So yeah, life is good. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. Well, here in South Florida, um, yeah, it was a beautiful day. And now there's this just dark cloud that just came over. Oh, no. Oh, well, can't all, it, can, it can't always be blue skies and sunshine. <laughs> Yes. Then you never appreciate it when it is blue sky. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you guys got slammed a couple of times with a couple of really big hurricanes over there. Everything. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And Costa Rica gets like when you guys up in Florida get all of these hurricanes usually passes on, on Costa Rica's East coast Caribbean side. Um, but where I am on the West Coast, it also affects the weather patterns. And while we don't get the hurricane, we do get like, you know, pummeled with uh, rain. So, yeah. Wow. So everybody here is very happy because I'm leading a one month yoga teacher training right now. And so these poor guys have been here for like a month. And I think there's only been about five days of sunshine. So they're just like so ecstatic. And some of them are trying to actually get burned before they go home. So that their friends actually believe that they were somewhere tropical. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. That's too funny. I love it. I love it. Um, let's get into it. What got you interested in this kind of work? Because you have a very interesting perspective when it comes to um, yoga, something that I share that, I, and I truly believe that what you're doing is amazing work. So what got you first interested in this kind of work? I got interested because like a lot of people, I got into yoga to become more healthy and have more range of motion. And right exactly at that time was when I really started to injure myself. You know, I hadn't really dealt with a lot of physical injuries before that. I mean, my neck would creak and, you know, certain things would happen, but I never actually dealt with like a lot of physiological problems before. And I remember like shortly after I started doing yoga, my back went out, you know, my back seized up on me. And and I was like, what the heck is going on? I'm 18 years old. This should not be happening to me. Well, what I did to deal with my back issues was do more yoga. And when I say yoga right now, I'm, I'm specifically talking about like stretching and trying to go deeper into the yoga poses. I mean, there's some poses where I actually did manage to get my feet behind my head. And, you know, I, I mean, I've done it all. And, but I cannot tell you how many times um, I would start a yoga practice and then I would start to, um, you know, during that yoga practice, it would actually hurt myself in, in debilitating ways where I would not be able to um, get out of bed uh, for a few days. And it wasn't until I think about 25 years later <laughs> when I ended up in a surgeon's office who was like, we need to do a spinal fusion in your lower back. And that was like a huge wake up call for me because it was like, this, this can't not be the answer. There's got to be another way. Um, on the journey to get there, I had started um, doing some muscle activation technique uh, sessions with a therapist who would do it on me. And and it was very interesting because I would go to see him. My back was seized up. My neck was killing me. Something was going on. And literally after that session, the pain always decreased like 90%. So if I would go and see him, my pain level was like nine out of 10 sometimes. Real story. Um, afterwards, after seeing him, it would drop down to like a one which is quite remarkable because not even drugs will do that. You know, I I've taken some heavy drugs. Um, nothing has really dealt with the pain that I was dealing that level of nerve pain. So the, after I had the spinal fusion, I went to see him and um, my guy, his name is Eric. He's based out of LA. And he said to me, you know, the stretching is making it worse. And I went, what? And here I thought I was doing something good. 
And he said, no, the stretching is doing, making it worse. He says, let's get, you know, X muscle group stronger. I think the muscle group that we got strong was like all my hip flexors. And so he got my hip flexors strong. He would passively start to stretch me. And it was nothing intense. It wasn't like, you know, trying to put my foot behind my head. It was just a simple little movement uh, that we do consistently in yoga. And the muscle went like weak like that. And I was like, are you kidding me? How many people am I damaging and hurting in my yoga classes? And that moment on, I swear to you, I have not stretched and I have not taught stretching since then. <laughs> I'm actually smiling and nodding because I had um, a similar aha moment um, as a personal trainer working at LA Fitness, uh, but I it was kind of... Uh, Towards the RTS, the resistance training specialist program, and uh, me coming back the next uh, right after the first weekend, and just like one of my clients asked me, John, what are we doing today? I'm like, I don't know, I have no idea what we're doing today. <laughs> I, 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 I everything that I know as a personal trainer for the past it was what uh, five years for the past five years out the window, everything. Um, I just want to say that that two things one. As a yoga teacher, and, and quite frankly, I mean, you know, I had actually started seeing glimpses into this beforehand. Um, and so, but I never went down that road of going, like, I can't, I have to stop teaching stretching because if I don't teach stretching, then what am I teaching in yoga? You know, like there was that conundrum and I've experienced so many yoga teachers get angry at me because... I, it's so threatening the idea of like, if I don't teach stretching, then how am I going to teach yoga? And, and that's the catastrophe I think in, in all of this is like yoga is not about stretching, but we've made it about stretching. I am, I, I I'm with you on that because I get into the same, well, I wouldn't say I would get into the same arguments as you would, but uh, as a personal trainer, I get a lot of trainers that are, telling me when do you stretch your clients i'm like never yeah even my clients come up to me and they're like can we do stretching can we do stretching today and i tell them no you all my clients know you come train with me you are not going to get stretched <laughs> so just have that in your back of your head and trainers out there that argue with me about stretching it's we get into some heated heated arguments a yeah. lot of times um, have there been moments where you just said, you know what, screw this, I'm, I'm done. Uh, I just want to just chill out in the rainforest in Costa Rica. I don't want to do this no more. <laughs> I, I had, well, that was the question I was facing at the beginning of this year. I developed this curriculum really for my students. And one of the biggest feedbacks that we consistently have gotten over the years is I wish the anatomy section was better. And the truth is, is like you can go and do anatomy in most yoga courses. And I'm going to just put myself out on the limb and say even fitness courses. And the functional, that's the key word I'm using here, functional anatomy is really pathetic. I mean, in, in all of these industries, and I know I'm, I'm kind of making it simplistic here, but I think someone who's in the fitness industry can appreciate a lot of what's being taught is akin to um, you know, third graders or fifth graders coloring in uh, anatomy charts. Of course, I don't know that you actually do that, but it's like, it's like you have to memorize all of these things. That's not functional anatomy. That's just like looking at, okay, my bicep is here. My quads are here. These are the four different quads, but that doesn't teach you anything about functional anatomy. It doesn't teach you what is that muscle actually doing and how is it shortening and why is that important? And while I don't think, you know, as us as yoga teachers, even fitness teachers need to understand every single muscle in the body. I mean, Christ, there's 600 muscles for God's sakes, you know, but we do need to have some understanding of some of the key muscles and understanding what those major muscles are doing. Because, you know, it's like, for example, in the fitness world, so many yoga, so many fitness instructors are so obsessed with like rotator cuff muscles, 
you know, we've got to get them strong to create more shoulder stability. That is true. But why did the shoulder instability start in the first place? It started in the first place because the traps aren't working. The serratus anterior isn't working. The pecs aren't working. These major muscles are not working. Why aren't they working? Why aren't they supporting the joint? Well, because you're putting too much stress and trauma on those muscles and you're probably stretching them, which is shutting them down. And so when you come into this like 150 pound bench press, the, those key muscles aren't working. What ends up getting stressed out is the rotator cuff muscles. This isn't being taught anywhere. It blows my brain out. And so it, when you said like, you probably want to stay in the jungles of Costa Rica, that's a very true statement. At the beginning of this year, I was kind of like, I need a break. <laughs> but it was kind of like a moment where purpose was knocking at the door of my heart and it was like, we need to start creating a conversation around this and um, we need to start flipping the script on some of these things. So that's kind of the passion that drives me. It's not like, it's not like I need to be right or I need, you know, some sort of um, uh, accolades. It's just, I just want people to start thinking logically about so much of this stuff because so much of what's being taught is a lot of crap. <laughs> One thousand percent anybody who asks me john how hard is it to become a personal trainer i, I keep telling them, all you need is three hundred dollars one weekend out of your life and a quarter of your brain yeah that's all you need to become a personal trainer it is not hard to become to get that certificate it's very yeah. very easy because of that fact you know as a personal trainer people are People And even as a yoga instructor, people are entrusting their bodies to us so that we don't hurt them. Yeah. They're entrusting their health and wellness to us. We need to understand what, like, you, just like you said, I'm just going to regurgitate what you said. What does the joint do under stress? Yeah. Does it understand stress? Yeah. And if not, why? Yeah, it's 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 such a it's like ugh, when I talk to other trainers, it's like stop, just please, please stop. Anyway, well, at least in in the fitness world, there's some, generally speaking, again, modicum of of fitness instructors who have some sense of the body. I mean, let's put a are. pen in that statement for a second. But but in the yoga world. These teachers, I mean, to get 200 hours certified, the yoga lines just change the requirements. It's 30 hours of anatomy. And what a lot of yoga teachers do, a lot of what, a, a lot of what yoga trainers do is give literally, and I'm not making this up, like here's some coloring charts, go home, color them. Are you kidding me? And so these people are walking out with like nothing or another thing that they'll do is they'll bring in like a physiotherapist um, to come in and talk. Well, how much of that is actually going to be retained? You know, um, again, the functional part of it. Great. You hear somebody talking about physiology and anatomy. Awesome. But it's like it's not being applied into um, a practical kind of way. And so that you've got that problem, but then you've got people who are not trained at all in, in um, the body into, you know, uh, movement, functional muscle movement, who are then in turn teaching other people, instructing other people in safe movement. Well, you don't even know what you're teaching, but you're professing like you do. And I'm sure the person believes that they know everything that they need to know. Um, so it's just this kind of like cycle um, that is, you know, the blind are perpetuating blindness <laughs> and in this, in this world. And it's, it's, it's just mind blowing. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. It's uh, it's uh, I, I mean, I can talk, I can talk with you about this for like two, three hours, no problem, but uh, <laughs> stay, staying on your program because your program yeah. is actually quite interesting um, because of the entire uh, yoga uh, space everybody's thinking about longer and leaner muscles to make stronger which is nonsense we'll get into stretching and it'll just a little bit but i want to talk about ayama how did you come up 
How did you come across Ayama to become what it is today? Well, I, I mean, to I started getting into muscle activation technique. That was my doorway into all of this. Muscle activation technique, for your listeners who don't know, is designed by Greg Roscoff. Um, and he started to realize that a lot of muscle function was being debilitated through the neuromuscular system. And so it's like connecting a brain. It's like the brain is connected to the muscles through a telephone wire, the nervous system. And so the muscle sends a, a message to the brain, we need to contract. And the brain sends a, mus a message to the muscle contract. And so when you reach down and pick up your dropped keys, all of these muscles should be engaging your trunk flexors, your hip flexors, you know. Um, but the problem is, is that people are bending over to pick up the keys and the muscles aren't working. And so the body then senses instability and sends out a nationwide Amber alert, like, you know, all the other muscles, like your back muscles and, the, you know, hamstrings, like contract, contract, contract to create stability. And as I was going through my MAT training, the question I kept asking was, well, out to people at MAT was, are there any people in the yoga world doing this? And the answer kept coming back, no. And I would, you know, go on group chats and, and whatnot. And I realized I need to create my own system, <laughs> which by the way, I was very reluctant to do. I mean, I'm much happier to follow somebody else's system that works well, right? I would, it's less work. I had to really go to the drawing board and just say, well, if we're doing this kind of sequences, if we're doing these kinds of postures, what is it that we need to actually do? And that was sort of the, you know, that was the arena that I started to approach all of this. And the most fascinating thing about going along this journey is like, you know, if you're going to do a, a hard yoga pose, like for example, wheel pose, you know, um, where you're kind of like on your back and then you bring your hands by your shoulders onto the floor, you push into your feet and your hands and you lift yourself up. And a lot of yoga teachers will spend, you know, the good part of an hour, an hour and a half class preparing to get into that pose by doing a lot of hip openers again and doing a lot of like stretching the quads out, stretching the heart or the muscles around the heart, stretching the core muscles and what I started to realize is like, actually, number one, we don't need to spend an hour and a half preparing to get into wheel. Number two, it only takes three kind of postures to prepare for wheel. And it's got nothing to do with stretching the front body. It's all about activating the back body. And if those muscles are working properly, it's actually much easier to get up into a pose like wheel. I only actually need to take about 10 minutes to prepare to get my body like fully functional and, and safely to go into a pose like wheel. So just kind of like over time, I just started to piece all of this together and, and kind of look, took what Greg did. And I don't teach anything that Greg did just for the record, <laughs> but I do take the principles of MAT is looking at different parts of the body and going, okay, well, if we're coming into such and such a posture, what muscles are engaging here? How do we get those muscles working better? So A, there's more safety and B, we can actually help those muscles to function in a, in a more stabilizing way. It's interesting because I know the, I know Greg Roscoff and his, uh, his, his practice, because I've had it done on me multiple times yeah. and it's hugely, hugely, hugely effective with turning muscles on, but it's, it, it, it's hard to, to, to think because that uses a stretching table, well, quote unquote, stretching table, right? You put the client on the table, you find out what joint is, what muscle is not functioning. You yeah. actively uh, you actively turn it on insertion in origin and the muscle yes. belly. So it's, it's in a yoga setting. It's hard to conceptualize how you would do something like that. Like when you find the joint that's not functioning properly, how would you go and help the, the client to, um, to reactivate that, that muscle group? Um, with the Yama, I don't really do so much, quote unquote, diagnostics of people. Um, I do in my 200 hour, I teach basic anatomy. Um, we teach the principles of a Yama. We go through the seven, I've defined seven groups of muscles that we focus on 
that is really specific to yoga. Um, in the 300 hour that I do, I do teach some diagnostics. I've taken Greg's, um, you know, basic box principles. And then we kind of take that and bring it into kind of a yoga um, uh, practice that would be really used for one-on-one, -on -one, but in a group setting, we don't. So what we do do though, is we look at like, what are some key areas of, of muscle dysfunction that people are working with? And so you know, or may know that the, some of the main problem areas are always stemming from hip flexors. Um, they always stem from trunk rotators, you know, the trunk not being able to rotate properly is always going to put stress on the, the knees and the hips. Um, we also want to look at like hip extensors and back extensors. I always tell people like my number one pose for longevity is to lie on your stomach and lift your legs and your chest off the floor, um, which sometimes we call it Superman pose. So what I don't try to really identify people's individual problems in a class setting. What I do is I try and anticipate, you know, most people are dealing with X issues. And, um, and so I teach a class to bring more stability to those areas of the body, which then in turn, you know, it's like, you got to work out before you can start working in. You can't work like if you have shoulder issues, the absolute wrong thing to do often is to just go directly to the rotator cuffs. we got to make sure that the pecs are working because they play a pivotal role in shoulder joint stability, that the uh, serratus anterior is working, that the, that the traps are working. So let's get the big muscle groups working first. And usually, not always, but usually that will solve the problems that people are dealing with their knees or shoulder joints or, or elbow joints. I had this one woman come to my training one time um, who was dealing with shoulder problems. We didn't do anything for the shoulders, but I, I focused the whole entire, it was actually a week retreat on developing core stability. And she actually told me like two months after she went home, she was pain-free in her shoulders, which was just amazing. We didn't even stretch the shoulders or work on anything up there it was just about like let's get the trunk and spine stabilized and that usually solves a lot of problems i do do some diagnostics on people obviously uh in private sessions that's where you can sort of isolate things but again even then you're still working um you know from the outside in this is kind of like a story that greg tells about when he works with worked with a a uh, golfing pro and this particular golfing pro had a frozen shoulder. Well, when Greg checked him out and did a diagnostic, it's like, yeah, there's shoulder issues, but all of his rotators weren't working. So if you can imagine as a golfer, you're, 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 and I'm not a golfer, by the way, so don't judge me, um, but I'm coming back and then I'm swinging, you know, well, if these rotators aren't working, what is carrying the load of the entire body, the shoulders? So his shoulder, this golfer pro shoulder was dealing with stress, trauma, and overuse. Um, and once Greg got the rotators working in the core and the trunk and spine, guess what? The shoulder problems disappeared. Mm -hmm. I am going to agree with everything that you just said, <laughs> because uh, ever since I've been introduced to uh, Jumpstart MAT, our resistance training specialist program, um, you're right majority of the people their hips their hips and their trunk is one of the main reasons why people can't function why they have pain everywhere else yeah another big part is the ankle but it's we're gonna get into <laughs> we're gonna get into some terms that drive me nuts and i'm sure they drive you nuts too as well um we're gonna talk i want to talk a lot about the entire concept behind um stretching and making a joint more flexible yeah how is stretch how does stretching harm the body well there's a few explanations i can give um, for why stretching is bad if you like for example this is a stretch that a lot of um, bodybuilders do is they take their arm um, up to the sky and then they take their hand and reach in between their shoulder blades Okay, so they're trying to push 
their hand down the back and reach further down the back in between their shoulder blades. Well, then they take to get further into it. Th that's an active movement throughout this whole movement. My brain is connected to all the muscles that are doing that movement. But then what a lot of bodybuilders do then is take their other hand, bring it to that elbow of that arm and push the hand further down their back, which then starts to overstretch the latissimus muscle, the pecs. I mean, there's all the deltoids, um, not to mention too, that the way that I'm doing that movement is my brain is sending a message to muscles to contract. So, you know, you have the anterior, uh, sorry, the posterior delt, maybe even a little bit of middle delt. Um, you have the traps acting out there, probably a few other muscles. So all those muscles are shortening in order for me to do that movement. But when I start to take my hand and bring it to that elbow, I'm now passively moving my body beyond the end range of motion, beyond what its capacity is, beyond what those muscles are, have that capacity to contract. Not the muscles to stretch, but the muscles to contract. And it's that movement, that passive movement that starts to disconnect the brain, literally disconnects the brain to uh, the muscles. The more kind of anatomical way of saying that is like, when I do it myself, uh, there's proprioception, like the brain is connected to the muscle. There's a, a sense of proprioception. When I start to passively move um, my body beyond that end range, the proprioception that the brain has to those muscles is disconnected. It's cut off um, at the source. So the brain is no longer uh, connected to that muscle, and it no longer knows where those muscles are in space. The space I'm referring to is your body. So the brain is no longer connected to those muscles. And because it's no longer connected to those muscles, you no longer have stability. So what does X bodybuilder do? They go and start doing bench presses or dumbbell flies or something like that but they're no longer using the muscles that they were stretching because the brain is disconnected uh, from those muscles. So that's one simple kind of like explanation on what happens when you stretch. <laughs> and that's a very good explanation. Um, it's the equivalency of like, you know, you taking a pair of scissors and literally cutting yeah. the phone line between your brain and your muscles. You might as well just do that. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then you're you're adding like even like 20 pound dumbbells or a, or a 50 pound bar. And all of a sudden you're looking at three months off, three months off the uh, off the gym floor because the muscle was off the joint instability. You know, like, John, that's what I used to do all the time. I used to go to the gym and, you know, like something would tweak in my shoulder. And so I would walk up to the wall before doing do before doing bench presses we walk up to the wall put my hand on the wall and then start to turn my torso away which was the absolute wrong thing to do but i didn't know any better cuz i would just watch you know these bodybuilders and then i would just develop like searing pain in my shoulders afterwards cuz after doing that i would go and bench 150 pounds well, then I would end up having to take, you know, a month, two months off. And then it was kind of this constant like rinse cycle and repeat thing. Like I would go back to the gym. Okay, we're going to stick with it this time. Hopefully I'm not going to have any problems. But I always ended up stretching my muscles, which then in turn started creating problems. Um, it's interesting. We'll get into that in just a little bit because I also have a very, I, I was also the same way. I was the same way. Like I would yeah. stretch before I would lift because that's what the, that's what the, the big magazines would tell you to do. The big textbooks would tell you to do the personal training coaches would tell you to do. But now, now that I know all this, there's a, there's a different way that I do it where it looks like a stretch, but it's not a stretch because it's, and we'll get into it a little <laughs> bit, but what I want to, uh, there's another misconception out there and this is a big one where you want to stretch tight muscles. If you have a tight muscle, you have to stretch it out. If you have a cramp, okay, the cramp, okay, you might want to quote unquote stretch it or just increase the range of motion, but that's a different story. I want to get your thought on that. Like, 
what do you think? Um, do you seem it's intuitive or counterintuitive to stretch tight muscles? Uh, knowing everything I know now and conducting as many experiments as I've ex conducted, I just do not recommend stretching anymore. I um, got into a big argument with a teacher recently. And so I was leading my 300 hour and I was not teaching, obviously, any stretching. This teacher came in and I had very clear instructions. Do not teach stretching if you're going to teach any yoga. But I actually th had thought like they were not going to be teaching any asana, any posture. So I really wasn't worried about it. I quickly realized that they weren't honoring our agreement and started teaching like a lot of postures. So, um, but one day they were teaching wheel pose, this wheel pose thing that I was talking about. And so what they did was there's one pose in yoga that you sometimes do where you come into a lunge and then you take your back hand and grab your back foot and pull that heel in the lunge pose. So the back knee is on the floor. You pull the foot towards your glutes, trying to create a bit of a thigh stretch. And this is so common in the yoga world to prepare for wheel pose because you have to open up the thighs. Well, by doing that, what you're actually doing is forcing the hamstring. So if I'm bringing my heel towards my glutes, I'm actually forcing the hamstring to shorten beyond what its capacity is to shorten. Again, brain disconnects to hamstring. So when she had all these students come up into wheel pose, a good majority of them ended up in serious knee pain the next day. And I was like, what the hell did you guys do? Like why you can't be getting knee pain because I fixed you guys, right? And I found out what she had done was bring the heel to the foot and it overstretched the quads and and the, the hamstring wasn't working. So when they went up into wheel, they had no stability in the knee joint and they had no stability in hip joints. And I got into a huge discussion with her and she was like, but sometimes there's just so much condensed fascia around the muscle that we just have to break it up. And I'm like, yeah, but you just created instability and now people are in more pain. And there's this idea out there that you have to break up this stuff. There's nothing to break up. The body actually will create, you know, like if you have um, instability in joints, the body does create adhesions and those adhesions can cause a lot of problems. And, but what we know is like, as soon as the muscles start working, the adhesions actually start to disappear and the, the body starts to correct itself, but it doesn't start correcting itself until you have stability. So like with a lot of guys out there, probably listening to this podcast right now are dealing with tight hamstrings like yo my hamstrings are tight <laughs> and and they they're like i got to get those hamstrings you know loosened up i want the trainer to force me to to uh stretch them but what you really need to do is get the quads working and actually i actually have a couple of videos that i've made where you kind of do a test first you see what your range of motion is by bringing your leg up as high as you can when you're lying on your back and then you kind of do these exercises to engage the quads. And it's fascinating to me, like most people, not everybody, but most people get 20 to 30 degrees range of motion. Once we start to en enable the quads to start contracting properly. So there's the agonist and antagonist muscle. You have the opposite muscle. The opposite muscle, in this case, the hamstrings are not going to let go because the quads are not engaging properly. They're not contracting and contracting on demand. So once we start to improve the quads ability to contract properly, um, it's amazing how much range of motion you get, but you just don't get more range of motion. You get range of motion with stability. So your body is actually stable in that newfound range of motion. That's, uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. I agree <laughs> with you because that's what exactly what has to happen. My, yeah. my way of quote unquote stretching people is I put them in a desired or a controlled or at the end of the controlled active range of motion, active range of motion, meaning what you can actually control and introduce tension, maybe half a degree past that and introduce tension there and tension th uh, through 
uh, that new range of motion. That's what yeah. I do. And I, I see a drastic change in people's ability to lift or do new poses or whatever it is that they do. Yeah. Like, so if you wanted to help somebody, um, like, so you're lying on your back and client brings their right leg up to the sky. What a lot of teachers will do is bring or, or instructors bring their hand to the heel and push, and push the heel. But what you should do, if you really want to help that person, um, is bring your hand to their shin bone and say, press into my shin bone. And I think that's what the tension that you're, you're speaking of. So that way they're actually, you know, engaging as they're pressing in and, and that will actually start to improve not only range of motion, but also activate all of the hip flexors as well and, and yep. create more stability. Yep. Apps 100%. And it's like, you, you limit the amount of pain that the person is in. Um, what about you? Do you have a healthy way to quote unquote stretch people or do we just have to, or do you believe that we have to just give it up entirely? You know, I think that there might be an argument to make, um, maybe like, and, and I'm going to say this very delicately, like maybe 0.25 to 0.5% of the time uh, to stretch somebody. And I'll give you a specific example because this is something I'm currently dealing with is like, so when I told you I, I got, I had ended up in a doctor's office with spinal fusion. One of the things that I've been doing is going to see someone with one of these kind of extension tables. So he puts me on the table, he puts a strap around my hips and I'm holding on to something with my hands. And then he pulls my um, my hips away, which is essentially elongating the spine. And it's this really cool technique where it starts to open up the spine and then contract and opens up. And the idea is that it actually will start to get pump uh, fresh fluids, blood into some of the disc fluid that where the discs have been compromised. And recently, I was dealing with an issue and I went to see him and do a bunch of treatments. And the first four treatments he did on me, I could barely get off the table because he actually turned up the volume a little bit. So it was a little bit more of a quote unquote stretch. It was stretching. And it, that goes back to that proprioception. My brain did not know where any of my back muscles were. Um, I needed to do that because my back was um, dealing with some issues and we're trying to correct some of the disc stuff that's going on. No matter how much muscle activation you do, it's going to be very difficult to correct some of that disc stuff uh, once it starts to go out. So he was doing that. And, and, and so I think like in some situations, there's an argument to be made, but here's the deal. He, he turned up the volume because he knows I'm going to go home and I'm going to do a series of exercises to activate my psoas, which maintains, you know, lumbar curvature. He knows that I'm going to go home and do all of these like Superman poses to start, you know, exercising those muscles and, and to start working with them. So he knows that I'm going to have more stability and any kind of like thing where you start to stretch, eh, I would say maybe 5%, like 0.5% of the time. And I, I'm very hesitant even saying that because people take that and open up a huge door. Well, Yogi Aaron said this, but, but it's like, no, like body, the body works better when you don't stretch. The body works better when you start to ask yourself, well, is there, why is there tightness there? So if you can only bring your arm up this far, it's like, well, why can't I only, why can I only bring the arm up this far? Well, most people go, well, these muscles are tight here. I need to stretch those muscles um, underneath the arm, but they don't go, well, actually what's lifting the arm. We need to improve the muscle function of those muscles that are actually moving that arm through that range of motion. Um, and just like the hamstrings, again, you know, hamstrings are tight because the body senses instability. When the body senses instability, it's going to be like a protective mechanism. The brain sends a message to all the muscles, tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. Uh, what we need to do is start using our inner intelligence and go, why is the body becoming tight? 
it's becoming tight because there's instability. What muscles do I need to work on to get more stability? Yep. Um, yeah, I agree. I'm going to agree with everything that you say, because I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's and, so uh, cool to talk to somebody who's like on, on this, you know, sort of like somewhat of the same wavelength and same languaging and it, and have an amazing. intelligent conversation with it. Yeah, it, it's absolutely amazing. Like, I love it. Like, this is the first time where I where I truly agree with someone what, what you're saying, not just like, oh, that's interesting. And not yeah. really agree with like, you know, a whole stretching because I'm just, when I hear somebody, like when you told me, when you said that they put you on that str on that table and uh, they, they strapped you down, it reminded me of this one time that I was, uh, I was working in Toronto in a small gym and uh, the owner of the gym was experimenting with this new way of uh, relieving stress from the joints. And he literally grabbed my legs and he was heaving on my legs. I was like, no, I'm done. I'm done because I felt something pop out of my hip. And uh, I, all I had was pain. And I was like, I'm done. I got to go see my buddy, Brandon, uh, up in New Market <laughs> at Strata. And I'm like, I, I, I'm done. Like, the, I, I'm not letting this guy touch me ever again. Yeah. Because... Like I said, like I said in the beginning, I mean, we're in the industry to help people with their health and wellness, yeah. not introduce more pain. So, which I want to kind of backtrack a little bit and talk a little bit more about the Ayama uh, method that you've created. Um, how does it help eliminate pain? Like we've kind of covered it, but I want to, I want to talk a little bit more about how it actually helps eliminate pain for the person that's doing it. Well, pain is always a symptom of inflammation. And why is there inflammation? Because certain muscles are experiencing stress, trauma, and overuse. So one of the areas that I deal with pain is in my lower back, you know, for example, and, or in the past, not so much now. Let me actually use a different example, because this is really kind of cool, is my knee, my right knee. Um, and so when I was like, 29, 30, 31, I had to stop hiking. Hiking is one of my favorite exercises. And I just, I, one of the hikes I did, I came back and my knee was so inflamed um, and I couldn't walk for about three days. Well, why was it inflamed? Well, I didn't know at the time. I just thought that I was getting old and, um, and, and I had to stop hiking. Well, what was going on looking back at it was those key main muscle groups wasn't working. And so what happened was, is like, A, there was no stability. The knee is like bone pressing on bone, you know, in the, in the, in the thing that's part one. Part two is all of these like little muscles and tendons around the knee. So you have um, plantaris, there's another one called uh, popliteus, I think. Um, if I said that correctly, there's like these little muscles around the knee that are supporting that joint to the knee plus tendons, um, sorry, uh, cartilage. And, and so these things are supporting the knee, but that's not their job. Their job isn't to support um, the, the, the joint to the knee. And so they become, you know, tr stressed and traumatized and inflammation is always going to ensue. So where a Yama comes in and goes, okay, what again are the major muscles that we need to uh, get working? We need to make sure that the rectus femoris, which is like the number one quad muscle, the, the, um, the most surface of the quad muscles, we need to make sure that the psoas is working. I've actually traced a lot of knee problems to the psoas major. Um, and it's kind of weird to think that, but it's like, if you look at what the psoas is doing in terms of its relationship to the lesser truncanter and lifting up the whole inner leg, which sends stability right down into the inner arch of the foot um, to uh, create that pronation effect. Did I say that right? Pro I always mm -hmm. get it mixed up in the feet, but it creates an inner arching lifting. Then you look at like the, uh, the glutes. So those kind of like three muscles, I started actually getting back into hiking again. And before every hike, making sure that those three muscles work properly 
and I actually don't get any more knee problems. And now this is like 20 years later and I feel more solid and more stable out in the world. Like I don't worry about um, having problems anymore. Another thing I kind of noticed too was like you go shopping in the mall with your family or your friends or something. And after like 30 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, your lower back starts hurting and then you have to sit down and it's like, oh my God, I'm getting tired. Well, you're not getting tired. Your back muscles are getting tired. Why are they getting tired? Because the glutes aren't working properly. They're not strong enough to support all of the stress. I know it sounds funny. You're walking around the mall, but that is a form of stress. You know, if you keep walking for a long period of time, and again, if those glutes aren't working, they're the shock absorbers of the body, which then, you know, take care of the shock in the knees and the lower back. Those two areas are going to start feeling the brunt of whatever you're doing, whether it's walking or soccer or hiking, um, or just kind of like moving around on your feet all day long. You've got to get those things working. So again, pain is always a symptom of inflammation in the joints. If the muscles that are supporting that joint aren't working, then it starts to become unstable and then inflammation will always ensue and, and create pain. And so if we can get those major muscle groups working, um, usually most of the time the pain disappears really quickly. Well, it makes sense. I mean, if the big, if the big guys are, uh, on, uh, and it just gives stability because they're, they're the strongest muscle groups in the, in, in around that joint and the l smaller guys don't have to do as much work and the pain goes away a little bit, a little bit more. Yeah. And this is something that Greg Roscoff might disagree with. And, and I'm kind of saying this as sort of a novice, but one of the things that I've consistently found is that if you get the big muscles working properly, usually like the rotator cuff, I used to be in always exercising my rotator cuff muscles to create stability in my shoulder joint. I no longer do that. I haven't had any shoulder problems because I always make sure like the major muscles are working and activated before I go and do any kind of exercise. So I think like I've just consistently seen if you deal with the big muscles, usually the problems with the smaller muscles start to take care of themselves. Um, one more follow-up question before we start wrapping up the show. Um, in line with what you just said, um, because I kind of believe with Greg Roscoff, I mean, you can't completely uh, not train the smaller muscle groups because you do need them. And we don't want any atrophied, atrophied muscles. We want hypertrophied sure. muscles to increase the amount of stability through that joint. Yes. Do you, uh, do you believe that once you get the big guys involved and they know how to work properly in conjunction with every all the different movements. Do you believe that it's a good idea to start introducing exercises for the smaller guys to catch up? Yeah, I mean, sure. It, it just depends on what the movement is, like what what kind of activities you've got going on in your life. I mean, if you're a you know um, someone who's a boxer or something like that, you probably want to make sure like all your muscles are working well. I, I actually was going off script a little bit in terms of like, I'm not sure if Greg would disagree or, or agree with me on that. I'm just kind of pointing out from a pain management perspective that if the, if the Terry's minor, for example, is inflamed, that sometimes, you know, it's more productive to make sure like if the Terry's minor is weak, don't strengthen the Terry's minor. Make sure that the pecs are working again, the serratus anterior, the, the trapezius, maybe the um, long head of the tricep is working. Like make sure that some of these bigger muscles are working more better before we start to work on those smaller ones. And, and then usually the pain will start to go away in those small muscles um, that have become stressed, traumatized and overused. Once we get the big muscles working, I consistently find that all the time from a, um, from working out in that sort of thing. Absolutely. I mean, you should work on all the muscles, but make sure that those big muscle groups are activated before you go and, and give them a load. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you don't want the small guys lifting a heavy weight. I'll tell you. No. That's, that's a bad idea. Yes. <laughs> um, 
we're coming I mean, it's close. shocking to me, John, how many people in the fitness world like are constantly getting knee replacement surgery, are constantly getting the shoulder operated on, and they get their shoulders operated on, and then they just go back to doing what they were yeah. doing before. It's like this is like this is what motivates me to come out of the jungles of Costa Rica and start a conversation. <laughs> we have to talk about the insanity of this and and bring some sense. Uh, where common sense has been forgotten. I'll be honest with you. I'll be transparent because completely transparent with you. Most of the guys that um, go into surgery for like a knee or a shoulder thing, if they tore a bicep or tore a hammy or tore a quad or tore a tricep or whatever, um, it's usually because they are taking something that they shouldn't be taking and not, <laughs> properly training the right way while they're taking that something yeah i i've had too many conversations with not i won't say clients because i have very strict rules when it comes to that with my clients my clients know very well like when i do catch you and i will catch you um you're you'll be fired right on the spot like i don't want to be associated with that stuff at all but yeah. like just other members of the gym i'm like oh i haven't seen you in a while where you been oh i tore my bicep I'm like you tore your bicep how oh i was doing bench press I'm like how much were you lifting oh it's a ridiculous amount like were you taking something I'm like yeah <laughs> <laughs> well what i can tell you is is especially in the yoga world it's shocking to see how many teachers like senior teachers have had hip replacement surgeries and knee surgeries or shoulder surgery and um it's it's like and they go back to teaching exactly how they were teaching before that nothing has changed and um and so that's like part of the conversation that i'm trying to start well that's that's great because it's needed the conversation is needed and just trying to give a different perspective on common terms that we have. Um, it's very important. I mean, I've had conversations with so many trainers on different types of terms. Stretching is one of them. Flexibility is another one. Shear, shear in the knee is just one that drives me freaking batty. It's like, oh my God, there's no shear in the knee. There's no way that you could do shear. If you have shear in the knee, you got bigger problems than worrying about your knee going forward past your toes and, and yes. during the squat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's going to be painful. It's going to be a yeah. painful, painful, painful thing. Anyways, <laughs> um, we're coming up close to the end of the show. And these are the seven or eight questions I ask all my guests. I just want to okay. get your perspective on these topics with the increase in people suffering from depression, from the constant, from the past two, two to three years of uncertainty that we've been living in, what yeah. would be the one thing that you could tell them to keep their hopes up? If, if people, for, what would be the one thing for people that are dealing with depression from the last couple of years to keep their hopes up? Oh my God. Um, I, I <laughs> have to think about that. Um, I, I mean, you know, I think that this, we're living in an, in an age where we just have so much opportunity and sometimes opportunity isn't what we think it is. You know, the pandemic was actually a huge blessing in disguise for me because it gave me the time and the opportunity to go back and, and kind of work through a lot of this stuff that I'm talking um, to you about. And so if, if anybody is dealing with like, you know, some of what you just mentioned from the last couple of years, I just pray, find some space and time in your life that you can just sit with yourself and, and ask yourself, what is really most important to me? And just go and do it because no time in history has there ever been afforded um, us the opportunity and the options to, you know, workshop ideas, workshop our, those things that help us to feel like we're living our life purpose uh, than at this moment in time. So I'm very optimistic about this moment of time that we're in. That's very cool. That's very um, different perspective on it. And most people are like, uh, 
Yeah, they they're they're glad that it's it's uh, somewhat over. And I'm like, well, like you said, it gives you a different perspective on life. That's that's yeah. very cool. Very cool. Um, what's the one thing that you do daily that amplifies your ability to stay focused? <laughs> There's a few things that I do. One is affirmations. Um, I use affirmations a lot and they really help to focus my mind, um, breathing exercises. Uh, there's a breathing practice called one-to-one -one breathing or pure breath, where you practice breathing diaphragmatically deeply. And you also are more to the point focused on balancing inhale and exhale. So many people breathe erratically and that erratic breath is always mirrored in the mind. So if someone feels like erratic, unfocused in their life, that life is kind of chaotic, look to your breath because your breath is probably mimicking that chaos. And the really cool thing is that if you start to change your breath, you can change your life. And that's a really kind of powerful idea in, in Tantra Yoga it's all you need to do to change your life is change your breath. So create a balanced breath, really commit to doing that. And um, probably people listening will just kind of go, oh, that's really nice. I should try that. Not, but it that's why you come and hang out with me for a month. So that for a month, we can focus on getting the breath, <laughs> you know, working and developing that one-to-one um, -one breathing. It's It's a remarkable breath. And it's life changing. Um, and I could talk for another hour on it, but I won't. <laughs> so those are those are a couple of things that I do. Oh, and the other thing that I do is I wake up every morning and ask myself, am I living my life purpose? And if not, how can I live my life purpose today? That's awesome. And uh, I could talk to you about connecting your breathe, your breathing with your emotion and uh, getting it all in balance because in Sistema, that's one of the main things that we focus on. That's the only thing that yeah. we focus on is breathing. It's powerful. It's powerful. like you said, it's life-changing. It's life-changing. Yeah. It's, isn't that kind of cool that all you got to do to change your life is change your breath. Yeah. I mean, we, we spend so much time in therapy and, you know, doing a lot of these things, which has their value. But to change your breath, like you can just bypass so much of that stuff just by changing the momentum of our breath. It cannot be understated. And listeners, for you guys listening out there or watching this on YouTube or Rumble, it's free. We <laughs> <It's> free. <laughs> um, if you could pick up the phone right now and call yourself at 20 years old, what would you tell yourself? Chill the fuck out. Can I say that here? <laughs> yes, you can say it. You can say it. That's then chill fine. the fuck out. <laughs> I was so wound up, always worried about things. And it really took me many, many, many years to figure out, like, just enjoy the ride, you know? And I wish I could go back and tell my 20-year-old self that. Just chill out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looking back, would you change anything? You know, if I changed anything, then the fun of the adventure wouldn't have been had. Um, and so I really, I, I really appreciate my ignorance that I used to carry when I was younger, because it got me into loads of trouble. And that trouble has made me the person I am today. <laughs> um, I do wish sometimes that I knew the technology around stretching um, and, and muscle activation. I wish I knew, understood the technology of muscle activation back then. Um, I, that's one thing I wish I could change just because I would have lived with less physi physiological pain, but it's not the story I was given. So now I, now I live it, uh, live to teach that. Very cool. Very cool. What scares you? I think what scares me the most is losing meaning in life. And that's why I'm so much about like having purpose and meaning and intention and so much of what I do. And, and I think that part of purposeful living means that you are living like intentionally in each moment of your life. Like for each moment that we're not aware, 
is a moment lost and we'll never get that moment back again. So for me, I'm like, is this really what I want to be doing right now? Is this how, and you know, it doesn't mean like I'm necessarily going to change anything, but there's a more of a mindfulness um, in what I'm doing. So if it's like lying on the couch and reading a book, like that can be purposeful living. It doesn't have to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to go out and start a soup chick ch kitchen somewhere. Like that's not what I, that for me doesn't necessarily mean that you're living a purposeful life. It's more of an inside dialogue and, and to have that awareness uh, perpetually in my life. That's what I, I try to shoot for. And I'm always afraid of like going unconscious. Probably one of the reasons why I don't do a lot of hardcore like drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be like conscious. <laughs> well, that's why I, I don't do drugs at all. I'm like, nah, I, that's, all, that's, that's, a, that's not for me. Yeah. Uh, where do you see Ayama and, and yoga in the next five years? I think that some yoga teachers are starting to kind of like awake from a slumber of like ignorance in terms of what they think they understand about the body and realizing, oh, geez, I don't really understand. And I believe through just different things that I've seen like that is starting to shift a little bit. And so I'm hoping that the conversation will start to move away from stretching. I mean, if Yama takes off, it takes off. If it doesn't, I could easily see other people sort of reinventing the wheel and, and doing their own thing, which is fine. I don't really care, but I, I hope that we can start to have a more intelligent conversation around why flexibility is not correct. And more importantly, also why stretch, stretching and flexibility have hijacked the world of yoga and now is infecting the world of fitness, um, fitness training and, and how fitness people have gotten on this mindless like loop of, oh, I need to become more flexible. So I want to flip the script on all of that and have a stop stretching and start activating <laughs> That's awesome. Um, just to add to your point, uh, stretching and flexibility have been a cur in the fitness industry since the seventies. So yeah. It's, uh, it's an old argument that you're trying to remove and it's uh, very difficult to do it. Yeah. Um, how about you personally? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Oh my God. <laughs> I don't have a clue. I, you know, I look back a year ago and I, th this was before I had written my book. This is before I came up with the podcast, my podcast series, Stop Stretching. And, and I was just kind of like sitting with, oh yeah, this, you know, do I really want to go global or not? Do I really want to start reaching out or not? And so I was, you know, after my book launch, I started going back and going, look at what I've done this last year what can I do this year? <laughs> and to me, you know, a lot of people stop themselves from doing things in life because they go, oh, I'm afraid of failure. To me, the words failure doesn't even exist in my, my vocabulary. And I, I mean that wholeheartedly. Like I, you'll never hear me use the words uh, failure because I, I actually don't believe in failure. I believe in life experience. So for me, this is just a game. It's like, how many people can I reach out to this day? And, and it's not even about money because I don't think I'm really making any money doing this. I make money other ways. So this is more like a fun project for me right now. So where I hope to be in the next five years in my perfect, in my like, you know, ideal world would be to start having more seminars and workshops on teaching people like how to activate their muscles, starting to teach people, you know, how to cultivate that proprioception that we use that word before. That's kind of a fun word, proprioception, to teach people how to fully inhabit their body and start cultivating more stability in their body, which in turn starts to cultivate more stability in their life. That's my dream in five years from now. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, where can people find more about you? Go to my website, yogiaron.com. Um, and you can, you know, the, everything is there. That's a gateway into my YouTube channel where I'm uploading, you know, two classes a week uh, to my podcast series, to my book. There's just so much 
You can also access my free um, pain-free series, which takes you through the seven different muscle groups in a yama and starts to identify like, how do we get those major muscle groups um, strong and why it's important to get them strong. So all of that is on the website. Awesome. And we will post the link to your website in the show notes. So everybody has easy access to your website and all your uh, amazing content. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Of course. Uh, any final thoughts? You don't have to live a life in pain. And you, you've got to create time for yourself to deal with that pain because pain is debilitating and it eats up so much of our life force energy that for a lot of people, they spend so much of their time in the day, like managing that pain. I really want to encourage people devote time to making your body stronger um, so you don't have to live in pain and no, it's a process. Give your, be patient with yourself. It took you this many years to screw yourself up. So give yourself time to put yourself back together, be compassionate on the journey, but do make that commitment to becoming more stable because you have a purpose in your heart that's longing to be fulfilled. So make the time to, to get stronger so that you can fulfill and manifest your life's purpose. Awesome message. Um, Yogi Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, like I said, like throughout the show, I am so excited. I was, I have been so excited to interview you, to bring you onto the show. Finally, somebody who gets what <laughs> I've been trying to teach and, sh and share with everybody and for you to be doing it in a, in a space where it's so in your face, like you hear yoga you're like, oh, I'm going to stretch out. Oh, I'm going to get lengthened. Oh, I'm going to become more flexible. And for you to be coming out and saying, well, not really, because it's not how it's supposed to be. Um, it shows it shows how brave you are. I'm just going to call a spade a spade because it takes a brave person to go into a space like that and say those words. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you. I appreciate oh, that all the power to you. And I really, really pray that this explodes throughout the yoga world to help stop this myth about stretching and strengthening because it's not the right thing. Thank yeah. you so much for that. Thank you so much. Love being with you on the show. Going through hard times is just a test. What you need to know is that when you get out of whatever you're going through, you will be stronger than ever before. And you don't need to go through it alone. Always know that you are not alone. Stay tuned for more real people with amazing stories that are just like yours. Until then, to everyone out there listening, I wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good night wherever you are in this crazy world. Hey, everybody. It's John from Resilient Reboot Productions and the Fitness Oracle. Thank you for watching this episode, and I really hope that you enjoyed it. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit the bell, and share this video if you are watching this on YouTube or on Rumble. If you're listening to this on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast Breaker, or whatever streaming service that you may be using, please give us a five-star rating and a positive res review as it will help us reach more people that are suffering from mental health issues. Before you go, I'd like to invite you to join us on Pod Inbox. This is a great platform that we can keep the conversation going. Over the years, we've discovered that the best way to help people regain their confidence back of whatever fitness goal that they are looking for is to put together a tight-knit community that will be here to support you in that journey. In order for us to do that, we are partnering up with Pod Inbox to help us create that platform and give you that opportunity to uh, have your voice. So all you have to do is click on the link below in the show notes and get your set up your free account on pod inbox right now. And let's hear your voice. Until then, I'll see you guys soon.